Now, Alan mentioned the Commission has got this idea of making a big difference, and I spent the last year uh, with a nail gun in my hand and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a, a table saw, making noise and thinking about what I'm going to do for this. And, and we're at this point now to tell you what, uh, what the outcome is. Um, very lucky to be part of a, an organization with Mike Batty. And is Mike at the back there? Thanks, Mike. Thanks also. Um, at, uh, at CASA, they've agreed to host the project. And uh, this is how we're going to take it forward. But let me start with this one. Um, June 2014, <coughs> Time Magazine, Eat Butter. Okay, so we spent our whole lives being told, don't eat butter. Okay, do you remember that? Don't eat butter. Don't eat butter. Now, everything's low fat, everything is, you know. I've always had a problem with my weight. I've always this issue about don't eat butter. Kind of grew up with this. Now they tell us we should eat butter. They told us that the science was wrong. They told us that uh, when they did the statistics, they cut away France. France had the highest level of butter usage with the lowest level of heart disease. And they cut away Korea that had the highest level of heart disease with the lowest level of butter. And effectively, they built this whole thing for the past 30 years, this kind of myth of science about how we should behave. And it turned out it was the worst thing we could have possibly done. Okay, that's what they're telling us now. So if we worry about paradigm shift, just worry how Nestle are looking at this at the moment, at this particular article, or every other food manufacturer. So this talks about the point that we can't deal with complex things in simple ways. We can't use simple things like, like statistics to say how we, how we move forward. These are complex things, the human body, and the, sci and the science of cities is as complex. Um, I want to talk, have a couple of quotes to start off with, and that sort of sets the scene. So those people who get bored, they'll see in about the fifth quote, it's a time for you to leave, go. Um, but design is a word that's come to mean so much that's also a word that's come to mean nothing. This is Jonathan Ive, who's the designer, chief designer for Apple. And he's right. I mean, I've been involved in so many di design commissions. Rob and I have written the National Guidance on, on Design, and I still don't know what it means. You know, we try, we struggle to try and find out what design means. And design for me has become straightening the lipstick on the gorilla, okay? Because we're not, we haven't got the fundamentals right. We haven't got the ability to put design in the right place. So this exercise is about how do we make design fundamental to, to everything we do. Uh, his boss, when he was alive, had the slogan, evolution, not revolution. So the success of Apple was based on the process that design is an evolutionary process. We learn by experiment. We learn to get better and better. We build up. We don't go back to first principles. We start with this process of evolution all the time. And that built the success of an incredibly um, important company. Mike, his quote, I think that sums up exactly this question about uh, we need to think of cities not as artifacts, but as systems built more like organisms, like uh, machines. We treated cities like mechanistic things. We treated them as ways, as problems to be solved. And we've gone out and tried to solve those problems of cities. And we used very blunt instruments to achieve it. So this statement says that we have to change our thinking about how we look at cities. They're complex things. They're not static things. Mumford, go back and read the old urban theory, still the best out there. Civilization rests on the fact that most people do the right thing most of the time. This idea that people can be trusted to do the right thing. And we've taken away that element of people being able to be trusted to do the right thing. We've told them what to do. That's been the name of the game. Um, John Turner. John, you must remember the old John Turner stuff. Do you go back and read them to see how right they were? And he was slated for this. Uh, urban settlements or informal settlements are just cities in progress. And that's what they are. If you go back and look at my, my lifetime, and I go and look at squatter settlements that I saw in Lima in the 1970s and where they are today, they're conservation areas. Okay, Why did they get there? And why did all those great schemes we went and looked at, the Privy schemes, why did they look like failed housing estates? Something happened that made these places better than the ability of professionals to, to, to create good places. Lovely old guy. It's easier to build strong children than mend a broken man. I think I spent my whole life trying to mend broken men here. I think mend broken places, places that we've broken. Everything we've demolished, we created in the past three generations. So aside, everything we value seemed to have happened in the three generations before that. So this question about how we build strong, how we build strong children in the work we do is quite fundamental. To quote the great urbanist, revolutionary, and sex god, uh, Russell Brand, uh, this is in the uh, station at Marlebone, people who think the system works, work for the system. Okay? But he's right in some ways. I, think, I don't think he coined this. Someone else must have coined it. But it's such a great slogan. We're so involved in the system, we find it difficult to change. So as a consultant or working for a council or working for the government, we don't think about these things. And I think what we've had the ability to do through this commission is to stand outside slightly and have a look at it from a slightly different perspective. <coughs> Chairman of the RTPI or President of the RTPI says this. I don't quite know what she means, but it sounds good. By comparing your system with others, you get to see your own in context and more prepared to question why things are done the way they are. I think she's questioning 
uh, the system, I think. I think that's what it sounds like to me. I hope she is. Let's look at it. The best cities we know about are the cities made over a long period of time, made by many hands. Okay? They're rich tapestries of life. Um, ever since we decided to settle down okay, and live together, uh, for 300 generations we've lived in planned and organized cities. Only in the last three we've got it wrong. Okay? During that time, cities evolved, and cities evolved by experimentation, by normal things, normative things happening. When we came along and imposed utopian visions, we just lost the art. And the real secret for us is how do we get back onto that step of urban evolution? How do we get back to things that we used to do well and do incredibly well without some of the instruments we're using today, without a planning system, funny enough? So everything out there is as a result of the planning system, and it can't duck the fact conduct the fact this is either as a result of the planning system or a failure of the planning system. It's either because of policy or because of lack of policy. Okay? But the planning system controls and delivers that. And I challenge anyone to tell me where I take a bunch of councillors to go and see a fantastic neighbourhood we've created in the past three generations. I can take them to a fantastic building. Of course we can. There's lots of good buildings out there. Or a fantastic place or a rich, rich mixed urban quarter that's not built, built on the bones of the past like, like this area. Or like a bustling centre, a new centre that we've created that we really value. So we haven't got it right, and we have to recognize that. This is what we've created. we created another set of problems. Okay, we created a problem here of something which is part of a planning system, which is a universal planning system now, and something which is outside that planning system. So we've created a new set of problems. And in that, those people on this side have lost that ability to urbanize. They've just lost the art. They've lost that ability to, to turn themselves into real places. And a lot of these places don't transition. They don't move from what they are into normal bits of town, like I mentioned in, in Lima. A lot of places have lost the technology and the ability to do things. So this is Darawi in Mumbai, okay? Desperately trying to be urban with a kind of technology like this. So this question about how are we helping solve a problem like this, and this is where the challenge lies for all of us, and I'll show you what I mean. When we try and solve them, we see it as a cookie-cutter solution, bright, shiny things in places that people don't want to be in. That's the kind of pattern that exists when government intervene on places like this. You know, serried rows of developments, okay, just seen as a mass housing problem. So it's seen as a problem, we'll build a million houses. It's not seen as a way of urbanizing or a way of building or forming neighborhoods. It's seen as a, as a solution to, to a particular problem. Even when we put all these axes and these crescents into these places with, uh, and we call them well-designed, they probably win awards, this place will never become Bath. Okay? No matter how many crescents are there. The DNA in that thing, the, the initial conditions that set up this place, will never it allow it to urbanize, never allow it to transition to something different. It's frozen in time, okay? and it requires a major instrument to change it. Even this, the Olympic Village, with the best designers, this will never become a socially diverse neighborhood. Okay? It doesn't have the bones in it to enable it to transition. And even if we build it as dense as we want, it will still be devoid of urban life. So we had 20 Chinese mayors coming along and saying, we built this, isn't it fantastic, but we don't have any urban life. What do we do about it? Okay, what do we do about it? They're actually missing some of the DNA that makes cities when they do that. It's not the product, it's actually all the other things that matter. We also know the challenges we face. So in my generation, my lifetime, 35 years being a professional, that's pictured forward to 2050. We'll see the growth of cities where cities will grow by an extra half. Okay? So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see 25 new mega cities in excess of, of 10 million. That's the, fa the fact, okay? It's my lifetime, you know, a lot of other people's lifetimes here, of being professional, you'll see that. Situations when they're under stress, people find different ways of doing it. They find different challenges, they find they challenge conventions. Even in London, 10,000 homes in Southall, in West London, legal beggars and sheds. <coughs> That's not counting Slough, not counting Hillingdon, not counting Hounslow, okay? They haven't started counting the number of houses that are built illegally. So this is when people operate despite government, not because of government. They do things like that. Question I say, so what's wrong with it? Okay, that's just cities in transition if you take the John Turner adage. So what happens? This is not passive house standard. So what? You know, so what? And there's a challenge we all face because the realities are that it's not going to change. It's going to get worse. Okay, if you look at the figures, by 2050, that same projection, 60 to 70% of the world will be in the informal sector. Okay? So people not paying taxes, okay? people operating in conditions like that. At the same time, we're going to see another major shift. Um, we also see these graphs all the time. Every time you go to a, a presentation, someone shows you the graph that goes up and a graph that goes down. And that's the reality of it. 
There's an urbanization curve going upwards exponentially, another one coming down, government effectiveness. And somewhere along the line, they, 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 they crossed. And Rob and I are convinced that that crossing happened at the start of our professional career. So we presided over those two arrows getting further apart from one another. That's what we've done. Okay, so that's what we've done in our, our professional careers. Government also tell us now there's less money to do it. They also tell us we're going to devolve, we're going to go local. They still act big, the instruments are still big. And also government tell us we're going to be smaller now. So if every Marxist-Leninist group in the 1950s calling for central state planning, there's the same number of neoliberal conservatives talking about small government now. So we're living in the narrative of our times. We're not going to get back to big government to solve these problems. And as I said, even with big government, we weren't solving those problems. We're living in this kind of world that says, what do we do next? And this is the challenge. There must be another way. Rob's brilliant cartoons. So what we're trying to say is, we don't know the answers, okay? but we think that we need to get onto some sort of track where we at least have a debate about this, because we all sit cocooned in our professional careers, never really de dealing with these issues. Okay? We never get the chance to think about these sort of things. So what we're looking to do is change the game plan. Okay? We're saying, unless we come up with new ideas, tools, and tactics okay, to make government effective, to make us effective as professions, we're going to be presiding over a graph that's going to get wider than our, the graph that we created through our professional careers. We're saying that those ideas and tool tools and tactics must work across that full spectrum. Things that we can't design. You don't design a neighborhood. You don't design a quarter. You don't design a center. You create the conditions for those places to happen. Those places form. Okay? So this isn't about a design exercise, but this is about a condition-making exercise of, of changing these places. It must be about how we organize complexity. Because that's the thing we're talking about at the end of the day. Okay, what Jane Jacobs calls organized complexity. That's what we've got to do here. So it's about this. How do we put in place the conditions that give life to a place, the conditions that make a place viable? So how do we build the strong children idea that we mentioned, okay, instead of the broken men story all the time? So how do we give these places life, and how do these places transform over time? And how do they get made up out of many things? Okay? How do many actions take place to, to make them work? And that's what we call, when we talk about massive small, okay, this idea of harnessing the collective power of many small ideas and actions, which is what we used to do in evolutionary times. Okay? It was only when the Medici stepped in and changed the game plan or the Richelieu stepped in on Paris and places like that. Most cities formed through massive small, okay, through many small actions and ideas, based on a normative way. How are we going to do it? I mentioned before, uh, we spent a lot of work on building up uh, the Smart Urbanism Network, working with the Royal Commission, and um, hopefully more with Mike and his team at, at, at UCL. We built up a, um, a group, which is about 12,000 people uh, today. So we started building our social media platform. So we're practicing massive small. We're trying to say, listen, we're not going to change the game plan by me sitting in a room talking to you guys trying to convince you. You're probably here today because you're probably convinced already in some form, hopefully. But how do we get out to, get out to a much wider, wider audience? We wrote, wrote a book. Okay, we put it out as our beta version. It was our sort of statement of intent, if you want to call it that. But we didn't want to write another book. We said to write another book would be a single statement at a particular point in time. We'd be guilty of a top-down thing. So how do we make it bottom-up? So what we decided to do is to launch this massive small compendium, okay, which is something which is about a source book of ideas. So we're inviting people to contribute all their thoughts. So Rick and your work you do around urban technologies, Mike and his work, any other people who'd be working around these sorts of things, Put forward these ideas. They might not be perfectly formed yet, but let's, have a, let's talk about them. So we're going to create the source book, almost like a search engine, that enables us to point to so many things that are happening. Funny enough, not within our profession, but outside our profession. I'm seeing more interesting things happening in business, economics, medicine, engineering, than, I'm happening, than I see within planning at the moment. So the idea is a source book. And the inspiration we took were three books that I had quite a lot of influence on me, I think. The one was the, the last Whole Earth Catalogue. Uh, any hippies here? John, you're a hippie, aren't you? A no? couple Hipp of hippies. Okay, this book is credited with starting Wikipedia and starting the environmental revolution. It sold two and a half million copies. All right, Stuart Brand. Okay, and all it was was a catalog. It told you how to bring your friend back to life if you overdosed on LSD, on the one thing, you know, <coughs> to how to build a log cabin. But it was actually something that collected ideas together, collected things together, and enabled you to sort of collect them together in one particular place. Which is unfortunately the Wikipedia, which is brilliant, is too much information. So we're looking to try and distill this into some sort of legible basis like the whole Earth catalogue. Second, I don't know if you know, the most uh, popular architectural book still is Pattern Language. Okay? 
We still get people tweeting us. I think, Rick, you did something on pattern language as well recently. People are still reading it. But I think what pattern language is so good enough, so good about, it gave us a narrative. It gave us a language and a narrative. And we're missing that language and narrative between uh, the different professions. Then the third book is uh, this book, um, written by an advertising guy, Paul Arden. He says, the world's best-selling book by Paul Arden. We don't know if it's the world's best-selling book or it's the worst best-selling book by, and it's the only one he wrote. But it's the power of communication, the power of communicating everything through simple ways. Now, I think Thomas, Thomas Jefferson said, if I had lived longer, or if, I'd, if I was going to live longer, I wish I had written less. So that's the challenge we've got. We've got to write as little as possible and to get the message over as cleanly and as simply as possible. So that's the three inspirations. We also think it should be motivational. It should provide a starting point for civic groups, for, uh, for professionals, anyone to start this sort of dialogue. It should be as a source book for all things, okay, to try and make it, deliberately widen it as much as possible. And it should be accessible. We should be able to read it at different levels. So enlightened citizens can read it, and hard-nosed professionals can read it as well, civic leaders somewhere in, the, in, in between. We've mocked up the book. We got to the point we know what the structure is, we know what the content's roughly going to be. We don't know the full content, but we're going out to people to say, can you help us populate it? So we're creating a framework within which we can populate something. Um, and that's what it looked like. We've also given ourselves 3,000 days to do it. Now, it sounds like a long time, but it's basically two political terms. Everyone says, every politician says, well, give me two terms and I'll make it happen. So we figured, I don't know how much life we've got in us, Rob, but we'll give enough time to sort of hand over to someone else through that process, but effectively it's about eight years. And uh, we started the countdown on the 1st of January, so we're into this process uh, at the moment. And through that time, we're going to write eight of these, one a year, okay? So we're going to update this as almost an annual, so remember those days you used to wait for your Beano to arrive, or your Jackie or something, whatever it was, that, that thing that arrived every Christmas, this idea of an annual publication that we put out. And uh, that's what's going to be. It's going to evolve, and as ideas evolve, the book will evolve. Okay? We don't quite know what the end state of the book is, so we're setting this on some sort of path, and hopefully something will emerge as a result of it. How are we going to do it? We started a, a crowdsourcing platform. Um, Andrew's put together a brilliant website that I know Julian Assange will weep when he sees it. Okay? It's, uh, it enables us to sort of download information or upload information, and we're inviting people to submit anything. Uh, you have an article, you have an opinion, you've got an idea, you've done a review of a book or a blog or an individual or an organization. Something out there where you're looking to challenge, this idea we're going to collect things, the internet of all things, if you want to call it, and we're going to put, collect this together in, in one place. And that's been launched already. We're going to launch a crowdfunding platform. We've gone out to benefactors to help on the development costs. We're on a Kickstarter program uh, running in, uh, in March of this year where we're looking to crowdfund um, some money to go into our accelerator program, and we'll have some sort of other advanced buying program as well. And we'll use the funds from the Kickstarter to fund an accelerator program. So all the good ideas that are out there, we're going to reward. We're going to say, how do we accelerate this? Because actually, it's going to accelerate the book for us. So we're going to say, this is a way of actually saying, let's get out there. Let's build an alumni network. And we're going to agree a bunch of trustees. And uh, through the work we're doing with CASA, we're going to reward good students and others uh, and effectively enable them to take some of those ideas forward. So build some original research. And then uh, we've got a publishing platform. As Rob said, we've got the structure put together for the compendium already, and um, we'll probably issue the first evolution, as we call it, of the book, not the edition, uh, in uh, autumn of this year. Uh, and then we'll start inviting more and more contributions um, as, we, as we move forward. The way, uh, we've got a cataloging system. I don't know if you remember, remember Doxiadis. I know, Mike, you know Doxiadis. Uh, he used to have this fantastic way of cataloging. John, you would have known as well, is that right? His way of cataloging system. So we've got a cataloging system. We're going to use this as a way, so if you submit an article, catalog in a particular way. So we're creating the filing boxes, in other words, for us to, uh, to, to move forward. We've also developed a glossary of terms or glossary of language, what we call our common, la common language glossary. So as you submit an article, we're going to make sure that the words start meaning the same thing. So we're asking people to look at the glossary when they put a word like collaborative intelligence forward, that it means the same thing for, for other people. Um, first chapter focuses on dynamics, and this is probably, some of you might have seen this stuff before, it's where we've said, look, unless we unpack the system and look at it in its totality, we'll be as guilty as everyone else. Okay? So we're looking at the question of what, is the, what does this whole thing look like? What do the dynamics of urban change look like? If you look at any element of change, it really has these three things. It's a, as I said before, it just needs an eye in the middle. It'll be a really nice Masonic symbol. Um, power, purpose, and truth. Okay? Where's the power lie? Where's the act of will to implement lie? What's the purpose of the project? What's the truth? Okay? What is the intelligence you're using to, to implement the project? 
And if you look at that, it's made out of these three things. The power is related to the government versus the people. So between the two, power lies. The act of will lies on that sort of bandwidth of government and people. On the question of purpose, it lies between viability and resilience. Okay? In other words, giving something life, building strong children, as we mentioned before, and the other side, mending broken men. Okay? Somewhere on the line, purpose is about those sorts of things. And on the science, it's the classic old science versus new science. So Mike's point about we're now feeling more comfortable about this idea of, of complexity science and how we manage complexity, how we manage a process of complexity. So what is the science we use? Well, we know that old science that we use hasn't worked for us. Uh, in, it still has validity in certain areas, but it's, it's not working for us in, in many of the other areas. Um, and in many ways, as I said before, those are bandwidths. Okay? They're like a, like a graphic equalizer. So they're not, they're not opposed. Everyone sees these things as two old science and new science. Let's fight a big battle between the two. Let's fight between resilience and... You know, we had that debate almost today about uh, when we were talking about Judith Roden's uh, uh, book. Everyone fights about these two poles, but they're not. They're like something that you just adjust left to right. More power to the people, more power to government. And each place is going to operate slightly differently. So to see this as a graphic equalizer uh, is, is quite an important issue. But let's make it more complex. Let's put the reality of what impacts on these things. And sitting around all these things are whether the system's open or closed, whether it's formal or informal, whether we're talking about evolution or revolution, whether we're talking about bigness or smallness or ordinary or extraordinary. And they're all like magnets pulling these steel balls, if you want to call them, into different places. And if you charge them up, it's an incredibly complex thing. So how do we ever believe we can control that? It's unstable, and it'll always be unstable. And in fact, in many ways, it's like music, isn't it? So we just got a big, we just got a big graphic equal, we've got a big sound desk we should be using here. And effectively, as the music's being played, we're saying a bit too much bass here, don't like the violin, bugle's a bit loud or something. And that's what planning is about. Planning is about fine-tuning these things on a regular basis. It's not about waiting for the music to be played and then coming back and thinking we can change it. It's about working all the time as we move forward to, to change it. But what do we have when we look at top-down systems? We have this perfect rationalized system uh, some of you might have seen the slide before. Obsessed with certainty, we see almost nothing. And another one of Rob's brilliant cartoons. My vision is that after an inspiring prelude of radical optimism, the planning movement will sink into a nightmarish miasma of procedural complexity. And that's what it's become. I mean, I, I sense this all the time. I took out a slide after this, which is the triple arson in South Oxfordshire recently. Sometimes I feel that way as well. You know, I feel like driving a truck filled with gas canisters into the planner's offices. I don't, I'm sure a lot of us have felt that way. But in many ways, we've created the system that's just not working for us. You know, who's it for you know, if it's not for us? You know, what's, what's the purpose of it? So this thing about how we look at this thing, which has become so incredibly difficult and so incredibly difficult to use, that all we have is a top-down system that only works for the big. The only guys who can play it are the big players. So if you look at the top-down system at the moment, it has ideas, it has tools, and it has tactics. They all add to what's called the system, the planning system, the design system, the delivery system. But the outcomes are this. Arrest of complex rules, deterministic placemaking, restrictive command and control. Only guys who can play to the big players. Okay? The guys who don't want to play build the beds and sheds in the backyards. They just say, stuff the system, I'm doing it anyway. And if 10,000 people do it, you don't change it. That becomes the norm. D. Hock, his quote, some of you might have seen this before, Simple, clear purpose and principle give rise to complex and intelligent behavior. Complex rules and regulation give rise to simple and stupid behavior. So, I don't know, you know I kind of said it before, I, I know Nick, you were the last one, is that I don't know if we're just guilty of stupid behavior all the time, doing what we're doing. 